come. I was present when all my three kids were born um, many, many years ago. And when, when Jared was born, he was my first. Um, that, was about, that was about 40 years ago. Well, it is because he's 40 now, but uh, 40 years. And I remember just a nice 20 year old at the time. And, and, uh, and my wife had gone in like at 7 in the morning. And I remember I didn't know what to do the whole day. You know, I'm just sitting there all day. And, I, and it's about lunchtime. I got hungry. And so I decided to kind of go out and get something to eat. And I came back and I got hungry again. I went out and the nurse said, Mr. Curtis, they're having babies in here. You need to stay in the room. And so that was one, you know, that was interesting. And then Jonathan, when he was born, uh, he was born in Plano, Texas, outside of Dallas. And, um, and we were getting ready to move after that, not too long after that, to uh, Pennsylvania. But there was a place in New York that um, where the mission was that we were going to be a part of. And the nurse was from that area in New York, and I was talking to her. And as they were going through the, you know, the birthing process, my wife was getting really, really mad because, you know, remember back then, ladies, you know, the childbirth classes, some of you ladies, and you have a focal point? Well, that nurse was right in her focal point, and she was getting mad and mad. Well, we had John, and then Jessica came along in Pennsylvania. Uh, in fact, in the day that, you know, was ready to go. It was about a 45-minute drive. And, uh, and we drove, and she was born in a place called Pottsville. Have you ever heard of this? Pottsville, Pennsylvania. You ever heard of that? And they named that for a reason, because there's pot, they should call it Pothole, Pennsylvania, because there's potholes everywhere, and I was hitting them. And because when she got in the hospital, uh, and, and, the, the, and they said, you need to hurry up and get ready. She's having this baby. So I think the potholes assisted the birthing process. But, um, so, so I went in and, I, and you know, I, how many, how many here, and you don't have, your kids are older now, remember nat, the natural childbirthing classes, or Lama, they used to call it Lama, something like that, at Lamaze, Lamaze, but I hated it, either way, you know, and they'd come in and they'd have all these, <laughs> oh, I hate, you know, these, these, these coffee cans made into some kind of body part, and it was horrible, you know, and, and, and then, and then we had to watch these movies. Oh, they were oh, they were terrible. Oh, I hated these stupid movies. I did not want to see this. And uh, and then uh, and then they do the breathing. You remember the breathing, ladies? How many how many here? You know the breathing. They would go, <laughs> and so you got a whole room full of about twenty ladies going, <laughs> and I wanted to go, woo woo. <laughs> I didn't because I didn't want to get in trouble. But anyway, it, it was bad enough. And, and they don't make you do that anymore. Now they just go in the room. But, uh, uh, but my kids, as I said earlier, my oldest son's 40 and my youngest son's 34. My daughter's 31. And, and you know, now I got 10 grandkids. And so you look at all that and, and, you, and you get my age and you say this. And even when you have little kids, they grow so quick. You, you say, they sure grow up what? fast don't they i mean they really do it just seems like they were born yesterday and now they're, they're off to college but one thing that we as parents really want for our kids we also want it for our grandkids we want them to grow up strong and healthy don't we i mean we want the, we want them to be you know physically strong and develop appropriately we want them to be emotionally strong and develop emotionally provo uh, properly but spiritually as well, I remember, uh, uh, but when something happens uh, that our ch children, child or children aren't developing appropriately, there's alarms that go off and flags that go, off, go up. And, um, and I'll never forget when Xander, my, my grandson, uh, who has autism, uh, when he began to display some things that weren't, you know, developing appropriately, uh, the concern that my son had, the family had. Um, and, and one of the things that he wouldn't do as he got older is he wouldn't eat. You know, he would drink the Pediasure and, you know, the um, you know, Insure or whatever else, you know, the, those. He would drink, but he would not, he would not eat. I don't know if it would cause, the, I don't know if it, you know, the texture or something caused a problem with him. But and it was really a concern because you know you can you can feed a child 
that PD Assure and stuff for a while, but at some point there's some real, it's going to cause some real damage uh, in their development. So uh, there's this place up in North Georgia that, uh, that Jared took Xander to, and they began to teach him how to eat. And over time, he learned how now the boy doesn't stop eating. You know, we, he loves, he absolutely loves pizza. And we were, uh, my, actually, my family's in St. Augustine right now. I came back last night. Uh, we're kind of having this kind of mini, we're celebrating our Christmas kind of thing because we normally do that and couldn't do it last Christmas. So they're doing it now. And uh, we went to the pizza time. Have you ever been there? Anybody been to pizza time? Man, that's the best pizza. They say it's second in the country. But anyway, that boy, and they give you these, and when you buy the pizza, they're like 16 huge slices, and that boy is down on three or four of them. And, uh, and so he eats now, uh, which, you know, you go, whew, you know, now he's doing the things that we think he's supposed to do. He's eating appropriately. He's, and I eat inappropriately, eat too much. But, um, but we want that. But let me ask you this question. Did you know that God, wants you to grow spiritually. He wants you to develop appropriately. He wants you to mature appropriately. Did you know that God wants you to grow and mature spiritually? Do you ever think about that? Just like you want your children to. God wants you to, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, when a believer, this is so important to get, when a believer doesn't grow and mature spiritually they will lack the ability to know what to do or where to go as they battle the world the flesh and the devil and i believe folks that we live in a time where many believers are what i call malnourished they really are i i, I, I like to put it this we live in a time where many believers are sustained by what i call spiritual junk food okay they get this junk food. They, 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 you know, they follow. And I'm not. A, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not against you know, you know, you know, singing the songs and following Christian artists as far as listening to them and that kind of thing. But, but what we've done is we, you know, we're all about feeling good. And and here's what I've found, being the old man that I am. That usually I feel good when I eat right. You remember when we did the fast a few weeks ago? And we did, I did the Daniel fast. I, I, I had never felt better in my life. And, 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 but we're all about you know, instant gratification in our culture. And we try, to, we try to bring that into the spiritual world. But God wants us to grow up appropriately. God wants us to grow up you know, and, and be spiritual mature. You know, here's the problem today. Many followers of Christ, they could tell you who their favorite artist is. They can tell you what their favorite Christian movie is. But they don't know anything about the Bible. They couldn't tell you the Ten Commandments. They couldn't list the Beatitudes. They, couldn't, they don't know the difference between an apostle and an epistle. They think they're husband and wives. Not true, okay? And we don't know what God's Word says. And then we wonder why our lives fall apart. Then we wonder why when all the world's just falling apart, that we fall prey to what they're falling prey to. And it's because we're not developing spiritually. We're not growing in God's Word. We don't know what it says anymore. We don't obey what it says because we don't know what it says. And it's so important, folks. That's why we're, we're doing expository teaching. That's why I'm taking you through what the Bible has to say so that we can understand who he's talking to and what he's having to say. Again, we know the Christian slogans. Many of us speak fluent Christianese. But we don't know what the Bible teaches. And we don't know what, what, what Jesus Christ really did for us. Listen, folks. This, the, one of the things that I really God's been placing on my heart is this is the year of family revival. But we can't experience new life in Christ. We can't experience the power of the Holy Spirit if we don't know who He is. If we just believe what everybody, some preacher or somebody else says. We've got to get in God's Word. We've got to know who He is. Let me tell you, and this is kind of a side note, you want to have a successful marriage, one of the most important things you need to do is understand your spouse. 
The reason why many couples, they just, they say, well, we, we just, you know, we just don't have anything in common. It's because they don't study each other. They don't get to know each other. You know, he's not meeting my needs. She's not meeting my needs. And, 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 and that's not what marriage is about. Now that happens, but that's not what it's about. It's about service. It's about, it's, a, it's about knowing the person that God has put in our lives. And that's true in our relationship with Christ too. It, we need to know who he is. Now, there's not a greater illustration of having to deal with what's ahead than a guy by the name of Joshua. Uh, Joshua, back in the first book of Joshua, was, uh, was, um, was handed the leadership baton that, would, that, that he would take the children of Israel into the promised land that God had promised that God told them that, that they were going to have. And let me tell you, it was not, you know, a lot of times people, when I've, I've read and I've, I've heard messages on this, and a lot of times people, when they talk about Joshua, they talk about, you know, the leadership ability that he had, and that he did have. But more than, this is not just about, you know, physical leadership of troops. This is about spiritual leadership as well. In order for Joshua to achieve what God had called him to do, stay with me, okay? He had to listen to what God had to say. He had to know God's law. He had to know God's word. He had to listen to God's voice. And so in Joshua chapter 1, starting with verse 1, says this, this after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, Moses, servant of the Lord, said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into a land, not that you're going to conquer on your own. He says that I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittites uh, country, to the Mediterranean Sea and the west. Verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, which is vitally important. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. But notice what he says in verse 7. He says, be strong and very courageous. And then he tells them what, they, what he needs to do. Joshua, he says, listen. He didn't give them battle plans, okay? Look what he says. We give them a spiritual battle plan. He says, be careful to what? What is it? I, I didn't get it. What did you say? Obey. Yeah. Be careful to obey all the law, not part of it, not the part you just that makes you feel good, not just pick and choose, but all the law my servant Moses gave you. And do not what? Turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. And you know what success is, by the way? It's just doing what God says. That's, that's what success is. And then he says, read this next, read verse 8 with me. Come on, great enthusiasm, I need your help. Keep the book of the law always on your what? And then what's the next word? How many here know how to meditate? I mean, really. I mean, we think in our, you know, with the new age out there, we, you know, that meditating is, you know, sitting in the lotus position, contemplating the lint in your navel. You know, that's not meditation, okay? Everybody here... Can, can meditate. And, and you may have heard me say this before, but, but I, I want to bring this back up. How many here know how to worry? Raise your hand. Come on. If you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. Okay? Because meditation's just positive worrying. Did you know that? Because when you meditate, when you worry, what do you do? You think of something over and over and over, and it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, Right? When you meditate on God's word, you're, you're, you're reading it, you're thinking about it over 
and over, and His Word and His Spirit becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it pushes out the worry. And it, and it brings in God's truths. And it changes you from the inside out. So, so Moses is told by God to meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to what? Read this part with me. Do ev- How can we do everything written in God's Word? This is a principle. How can we do everything written in God's Word if we don't, if we don't know what it says? We can't, can we? He says, do everything written in it, then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not, become dis- do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So as you, as you listen to the law, as you, as you memorize it, as you meditate on it, as you allow God's Spirit to teach you, His truths, God will walk with you. And He'll give you His success in your everyday life. Now, we're we're in the book of 1 Peter. And and Peter is writing to very discouraged people. How many here, you're discouraged? You look at the world and and you're starting to get really discouraged. Anybody? Yeah. You look around and all the mess that's going on. And you're saying, golly, when will it ever get better? Um, and so Peter looks to these, these, these Jews who were scattered uh, throughout Asia Minor. And all throughout Asia Minor, they, they were being persecuted. They were ex- exiled. They weren't even at home. They were in a foreign land. And Peter writes these believers, and some, uh, these Jewish believers, and he encourages them on how to live. He, he doesn't just say, cheer up. He doesn't just say, you know, let's, you know, kind of put a smile on your face. He says, here are some things that if you will do and you will let penetrate your heart, your mind, your soul, and your spirit, if you will allow that to happen, God will be with you and give you peace and strength through this journey. He will give you his success in your life. And so he says in verse, verse 13, what's the first word there? Remember what we said about therefore? When you see therefore, you always ask what therefore is. Therefore, yeah, okay. Uh, and we, we already established in the past messages that the first part of it, you know, it's, it's who, you, who you are in Christ. He establishes who they are in verses 1 uh, uh, through 2, verses 1 and 2. And then verses 3 through uh, 12, he talks about what we have the things God has provided for us. And then now he says, based on all of that, he says, with minds that are what? Alert and fully sober. Set your what? Hope. Okay, let me just stop there. He says, those of you that are going, I know there's a lot of stuff going on around you. I know it's easier to be distracted. I know it's easy to be afraid. I know it's easy to focus on all the stuff that's that's around you that becomes a a threat to your family. But he says, be alert. Be focused, in other words. Be sober-minded. Then he says, he goes on to say, he says, he says, set your hope. You know what hope is? Hope's just another word for faith. Did you know that? You know, when we talk about faith, we talk about the faith to go through a certain situation. Hope is what I call uh, futuristic faith. You know, when I say, you know, we, we need to have faith today, hope is having faith for tomorrow. It's trusting that God will do what he said he's going to do. May not be next week, may not be next year, may not even be in my lifetime, but I'm setting my hope, I'm believing God that he's going to do what he says he's going to do in his word. And it goes on to say this. He, he, says, he, says, um, uh, he says, set your hope on the grace of, to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. In other words, this is not, I hope it happens. This is a faith that it's going to happen. And we're getting ready for that to take place. And look at verse 14. I love the way he starts this verse. As who? Obedient children. How many here have disobedient children? (laughs) I have have a grandson that's, I won't even say his name. His initials are Beckham. But... uh, but he struggles with being obedient. I, I was talking with him yesterday, and 
And uh, he, I said, I said, Beck, he was doing something I told him not to do about 15 times. And I said, Beckham, sit on the couch. That, for him, that boy is so full of energy, I, I wish I could tap into some of it. But uh, he, he was sitting and he, and he would slide off the couch. He would keep his hand on the couch thinking that he, you know, kept the spirit of the law. And, and, uh, but he would slide said, oh, yes, going to have to stay a little longer. Sit on the couch. Then he would turn around and lay on the couch. You know, he would do everything but what I said. And, uh, and so it cost him. But, but Peter says, be as obedient children, those who just do what God says. Say the word God and I'll do it. He says, look at this. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. When you lived before God your BC years, those things that messed your lives up, those things that hurt other people when you did it, those things that, that in your ignorance you didn't know any better because you were lost in your sin. But then the light of God came into your life and He gave you new, new meaning, new light, new, uh, new, new life. And He said, and He says here, He says, don't live in those evil desires. You see, the problem today is that people are still living in the, their evil desires. Listen, we are depraved people without God. And you know what that means? That means we are hopeless without God. And, and, and have you ever talked to somebody who is just extreme? We're all depraved, but extre- they have allowed their mind to just go into the recesses of evilness. Have you ever talked to anybody? We see them. I mean, the things that are happening are not new. It's because when you leave the human nature by itself, it's capable of all kinds of misery. But then he says this, he's speaking to believers, he's saying, but just as he who called you is holy, God is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. How many people does that scare? How many people when you hear the word holy or holiness Boy, it just scares you. You think, golly, what does that mean? Because we sometimes uh, equate holiness with perfection. Or we sometimes equate, uh, equate holiness with purity. All holiness, all holy means is to be set apart. You see, when God saved you, when He redeemed, and we're going to talk about that word in a minute, but when He made you new inside, he wants to make you holy. He, now, now, it has to do with two things. Holiness is not saying, you know, uh, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, and, and when, I, when I, you know, kind of check off my list of the things that I don't do, then I'm holy. It's not about that, because I can't make myself holy. Only God can. So holiness is this. Holiness is saying, stay with me, holiness is saying this, that I'm separated from the things that pull me down. I'm separated from sin, and I'm separated to God. How many here are holy in your marriage? You know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm, let me say this. Ladies, how would you feel if your husband came to you and said, I'm not going to be home tonight. I'm going out with my girlfriend. How would that make you feel? You know why he can't do that? Because he's separated to you. He may have done some things that were inappropriate before, but he's separated from that, and he's separated to you and vice versa. You see? And that's, that's what it means to be holy, that we're saying no to those things that messed us up for so long. May have given us you know, little amounts of pleasure, but over the long haul just destructiveness but now i'm i'm moving away from that and i'm moving to god that's what it means to be holy to be separated and he goes on to talk about this a little bit more look at this next verse 17 he says since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially live out your time as foreigners i know you're in a foreign land you're strangers you're aliens you're exiled in a foreign land here and what's the next two words Reverent fear. He's saying that God is a judge. By the way, there is a judgment for believers. Did you know that? 
There is a judgment that's called the judgment seat of Christ. And while our sin will never be judged because Christ judged our sin on the cross, while our sin will never be judged again, our works are judged. It's, it's like the best, the best thing I can share with you is like a, an Olympic. Or we have the Olympics now. It's called, the Greek is kind of a bema seat. And it's an award ceremony. And God will reward us for the motives of our heart and the works that we did for him. The works will be, will be judged and awarded. Now, and then we'll be awarded for it. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 3 talks about it. You know, it, our works are either going to be wood, hay, and stubble, stubble, and they'll burn in a fire, or they'll be gold, silver, precious stone, and they'll last. And they'll make an impact. And so, what it's saying here is that Jesus will be that judge one day. Father will be the judge. Now, the best way I can like, liken this to is my dad. I love my dad. I love him with all my heart. But there, there are some words that I hated coming from the lips of my mother when I was a kid. You know what they were? Just wait till your father gets home. That was a horrible day because she'd tell me that in the morning and he don't come home to five or six at night. That was awful. Suffered all day, you know, and I feared my dad because I knew that if I disappointed or if I disobeyed him, there were consequences to that disobedience. Nothing wrong with that. You want your kids to have that kind of healthy fear. But we need to have that kind of fear with God, reverent fear. The reverent fear that says, God, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to disrespect you. I don't want to be disobedient to you. Because here's, here's the truth. Get this. When you and I learn to fear God, we don't have to fear anything or anybody else. But if you don't fear God, you're, you, you're afraid of everything. Oh, what if the economy collapses? What if I lose my job? What if the car breaks down? You know, but when you have a healthy, when I, you and I have a healthy fear of the one who actually matters, his judgment is the only one that matters. Then we don't have to fear, I don't have to fear what other people think. I don't have to fear about a, a plane crashing on the way to Ethiopia. I don't fear any of that stuff because I'm trusting in my Father, my Heavenly Father. And he goes on to say this. I could spend all day here. I'm sorry. I'm going to move on. I'm sorry. Here we, okay. Okay. Uh, for you know that it was not with perishable things, things that don't last, such as silver or gold. I mean, we all want money, but it ain't going to last. We can't take, you know, you can't, you, you can't take it with you. I, there's a, people standing around a, a, a grave of a rich man. They said, how much did he, how much did he leave? And other guy said, well, he left it all. I mean, you don't take it with you. It doesn't last forever. And it says, it says uh, for you not with perishable things, silver and gold, but you were what? Redeemed. When I was a kid, I've shared this with you before too, but when I was a kid, we used to collect, you know, returnable bottles. You ever do that? And you get as many as you can. You go to the 7-Eleven or a little store, and you take it and you, and, you can, and you redeem those bottles for cash. Well, here's what he's talking about when he says redeem. Important. Some people say, well, you know, I'm just not a doctrinal person. That means they don't want to know what God has to say. Be a doctrinal person. Doctrine simply means teaching. Be a person who wants to learn God's word. Redeem, Redemption is a really important part of your salvation because a word here signifies a slave on the trade, on the slave, and, and he, he needs to be bought. Listen, did you know that we, before we come to Christ, that you know who our father is, spiritually speaking? Satan. We're not of God. We're of this world because of our sin. It separates us. And, and the word redeemed not only for the slave, but it's also meant for POW, prisoner of wars. And they would go and they would, they would redeem, they would buy back these prisoners of war back to their people. And what God did was this. Here am I, I'm, I'm a slave on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the trading block here. And I'm by myself, and I have no hope. And, and Jesus Christ says, I'll make a bid for him. I'll make a bid for you. I'll buy you. And you will be mine. And that's what happened. Look, look what happened. Look at what it says here next. It says, it says, you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down you 
to you from your ancestors. But look at verse, read this next verse. Will you read me? Come on, stay with me. This is really good stuff. Here we go. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed, or that means to be made manifest, okay? He may be made known, he became flesh, okay? But was revealed in these last times for your sake. He bought us with his blood. He, he sacrificed his life so that he could not only adopt us into his family, forgive us of our sin, but adopt us into our family, and we are part of him. We, the Bible says we are joint heirs with him. Let that sink in for a minute. That God loved you enough to call you out from where you were, where I was. And he loved us so much that he paid the ultimate price. Jesus Christ, his son, died on the cross. Shed his blood. Look at verse 21. Through him you believe in God. And here, here it is again. Don't forget this part. This always has to be a part of the gospel. He says, who raised him from the what? And glorified him. And so your faith and hope, remember that futuristic faith, that your hope are in God. You might be hurting now. You might be struggling now. You might not figure out what's going on. But because Jesus bought you with his blood, because he paid the ultimate price, because he became the lamb, a sacrifice for your sin and mine on the cross, we have this hope in God. Then he says, verse 22, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth. Now, now we can't make ourselves clean. Don't misunderstand. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when we are obedient, when we are obedient to God, that God purifies and cleans us. Not, not by our efforts, but by his blood that was shed on the cross, by his, the power that he can uh, that has been allowed to be opened up in us. It says, and, and, and then he teaches us something. He says, by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love for one, love one another, what? Deeply from the heart. You can't do that without Christ. He gives us that ability. Look at verse 23. For you have been what? That, that word gets misunderstood, but that Jesus talks about it in John chapter 3. He says, except a man be born again, or a woman, they cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says here, you have been made alive, born again, made alive. You were dead, but now he made you alive. Not of perishable seed, you know, you're not of human form, but of what? Imperishable through the, read this with me, through the living and enduring word of God. So as, God word, as God's word of redemption comes to us, as God's word of truth comes to us, and we obey it and apply it, He works in our lives to change us and keep us. And then, and then he, he, he quotes uh, Isaiah 40, uh, verses 6 through 8 here. Peter says, For all people are like, he says, you've been, before, he says, you've been born again, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible through God's word as it's been revealed to you. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flower of the field. Flowers of the field. The grass withers. How many here have had flowers? Like the marigolds, they last for a while and then they go away, you know. He says, they, they, the, my, grass, my grass is brown these days, is yours, you know, right? withers and the flowers fall read this next part with me but the word of the lord endures forever again there's only two things that last for forever in this room not this podium not these chairs is that you will you'll live for eternity and in, in either a place called heaven or a place called hell that the bible clearly teaches and there's you know what else is going to live forever in this room god's word in other words, you can count on God's word no matter what. No matter what's going on in our country, no matter what the political, political landscape is, no matter what kind of things are going on all over the world, which are pretty wicked things, the word of the Lord endures forever. And then 
And this is the word that was preached to you. <laughs> Look at this. Chapter 2, verse says, there, therefore again, based on who you are in Christ, based on what Christ has done for you, based on him, him, him redeeming you and sanctifying you and cleansing you and, 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 and sustaining you, he says, rid yourselves. And, and the word rid yourselves has to do with, with taking off dirty garments. You ever worked hard and you just stink? If Bill ever worked hard and stinks, you said, boy, you need to go take a shower. Ever happened? Joey Lynn, I know it has. <laughs> you know, you know what it is, you know. Uh, have you ever done that with George Rose? Say, you know, you, you need to hit the shit. Yes, she has. <laughs> we used to do a song. I'm going to sing it to you. I don't care if you like it or not. We used to do this. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was to take off the old robe and put on the new. Actually, he put it on. Well, the old robe was dirty, all tattered and torn. But the new robe was spotless and never been worn. Oh, the best thing in my life I ever did do was to take off the old robe. Actually, he did that. And he put on the new. You know, And that's what happens. You know, God takes off that old stuff that's messed our lives up and he puts on his righteousness. It's called the doctrine of imputation where here's the sin of Steve Curtis, here's the righteousness of Jesus Christ and I'm messed up, I stink. And God puts his sweet smelling righteousness over me. And now when God the Father looks at me, he no longer smells smelly Steve Curtis. He no longer sees wicked Steve Curtis, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He says, he says, rid yourself, and I don't have time to, I'd love to spend the rest of the day on this, but I don't have time. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. And look at verse 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk. And then, and then he gives us a, 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 what I think the key to the message is today. So that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Let me say it again. So that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And then he says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Um, I want to talk to you for a few minutes and I'm done. I'm going to sit here if that's okay. Um, we face a wicked world today. And, you know, the world's always been wicked. But it's even more wicked because sin is more prevalent. It's more, it's more accepted than it used to be. It used to be shameful to be a part of sin, but now we just kind of accept it. And, it, and, and there's atrocious, evil, sinful acts going on all over this world. All over this area. And, but when one comes to our attention, we ask the question, why? Back on Valentine's Day, in Broward County, Florida, that is where I was raised. In all my young years, high school years, I, I went to high school, and not the school that was that's a newer school, but um, I was raised in Broward County, South Florida. And so when I heard about the shooting and the loss of 17 lives, the question that people had is, why didn't God stop this? I mean, he could have, couldn't he? God's God. God can do what he wants. Why didn't he stop? And, and I, don't, I don't claim to have the full understanding of God's mind and how things operate. I do know that God doesn't see things in terms of the temporary, but in the terms of the, the eternal. I know that. Um, but folks, we need to go back to Genesis chapter 1. And I won't preach a message, but when God said to Adam and Eve, you got a choice. I want you to love me. I want you to follow me. So to do that, you know, back then, we got millions of rules. There's only one rule. Don't disobey me. Don't eat off of that tree. And guess what man did? 
in all of his sinfulness. He, he disobeyed God. And the Bible tells us that by one man, sin passes to all of us. And God still wants us to love Him. In fact, He loves us so much that He gave His Son to take care of the one thing that separates us from, from God and Him, and that's sin. God cannot look upon sin. God, God must fellowship with righteousness. And as the scripture said, before the foundations of the world, God planned Jesus Christ, His Son, sent His Son, planned to send His Son to die on the cross. So the real question is, you know, well, why didn't God stop it? Well, if God stops all of that, then He stops your choice of choosing Him. You see, if you choose to love, you've got to have the option of choosing to hate, right? If you choose to do right, for it to be a real choice, you, there's got to be a choice of wrong. And God would have to rob us of that. And, and part of me says, please do. <laughs> you know. But, but he wants, he created us so that not only that he could love us, but more than that, folks, salvation's, this is something so important. I'm talking to somebody about this today. Salvation's not about us. It's all about him. He didn't save us. You know, we think that, that, that God is, is, is sitting around ready to do our bidding. No, no. Folks, we got that backwards. We are His sons and daughters. We are His servants. And so when tragedy happens, like it did, and the depravity of man surfaces to the light, to the limelight, we wonder, oh, how could this ever happen? Well, it happens all the time, everywhere. And folks, this is my point. Get this. That's why Jesus came. Because he knew we can't fix this by ourselves. We've tried. You, know, you, can, you, can, you can have all the gun control, whether you're for it or against it. This is not an issue of gun control. But you can take away every, every one of the guns if you want. You can take away, you can take, you, but people are going to still sin. And, and you know what happens when we have the choice to do the wrong thing? We choose to do the wrong thing. And sometimes, a lot of times, sometimes it affects us because we did it. Sometimes it affects innocent people who had no, had nothing to do with it. Folks, please hear my heart here. That's why they need Jesus. The only thing that's going to change the trajectory of this world is Jesus Christ. We can't, for all have sinned and fall short. We miss the mark. We can't fix stuff. We have to trust in one who can. And folks, listen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but experience eternal life. And I was, I was, you know, when we lose somebody we love, there's nothing more devastating than that. I, I'll never, George, I'll never forget that phone call you gave me that one morning when Jason, I was talking with Rose about her son, was a border patrolman, keeping the border safe. He was rallying up some uh, illegal aliens to be taken care of, and a truck veered off the road and took her son's life. Now, how do you get through that? See, you don't get over it, but how do you get through it? And here's what I know about Jason, because I've talked to him personally. Jason trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And the reason we can get through is because we know we're going to see him again. We know that this isn't it. And if you're banking on the political system of this country, if you're banking on some government, if you're banking on some kind of scheme or idea or just think positive, and I'm not saying it's wrong to think positive, don't misunderstand me. If you're banking on all man-made 
contraptions that we need to follow to make life better, you're, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, and then to die is gain. And I, 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 I know that God is in control, and I'm not. And I know that what we're called to do here today is to get to know Him and to open, as I did earlier, open God's Word and understand what it means to be redeemed. Understand what it is to have a real hope. Not hope it happens, but a real hope. Understand what it means that we were born again, not of this corruptible world, but of incorruptible seed. What does that mean? Because it's not just some theological term that's up in the sky somewhere. It has to do with where we live now and our lives now and how we cope with whatever it is that's coming down the pike for us. Maybe you're here today and you're feeling a call of God. You're feeling the tug of God's Holy Spirit. You may not even know what it is. But he's pulling you towards himself. My encouragement to you right now is to say yes to him. And you say, but Pastor Steve, if, if I turn, trust Christ with my life and I give my life to him, does that mean my life's going to be great, no problems? Absolutely not. You're going to have all, you may even have more problems because of it. But God will give you some capacity to praise him, to follow him. And it, as we follow him, and we trust Him, and we praise Him, and we trust Him even when we can't figure it out. He gives us grace, and He gives us peace, and He gives us contentment, and He gives us strength when there is nowhere to get it on this planet. If you're here today and you've never trusted, and you just want to, let, let me lead you in a prayer. There's no magical prayer. I don't have one of those. Uh, but just hopefully help you to articulate what's going on. Say something like this. Would you bow your heads with me? Say, God, I'm a sinner. I've blown it. I can't get to you by myself. I need you to come to me. I invite, I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead and I surrender my life to him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look at me for just a minute. You know, some of you know what I'm going to say. This is so important though. If you just received Christ, we want to help you on this next step. There's a tear-off thing in your program. It says communication slip. Fill it out on the back. It says, I, today I received Christ. Just check it. Give it to Craig in the back, even if you're not sure what that means. And we'll give you some information that will help you in your next step in following Christ. Maybe you're here today, and I'm talking to followers of Jesus right now. Maybe you've been discouraged and disappointed. I don't know. Or maybe you look around and maybe you're frightened. Maybe today is the day we say, okay, hey, it's all of, I'm putting all my spiritual eggs in one basket. I'm taking all of what I believe and who I am, and I'm trusting Jesus Christ. Folks, let me, let me just be up front with you. If you wonder where I stand, let me make it real perfectly clear. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. None. He is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father unless they come through me. And if you're here today and you, you say, I'm a believer, but I'm, I'm nominal. I, I, I'm struggling. But today you say, I'm going to follow. As for me and my house, we're going to follow Jesus Christ. We're going to, we're going to seek His face. We're going, to, we're going to grow to know Him. And we're not, going to, we're not going to be lazy in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going, to, we're going to be diligent. If you just need to pray, this is. would you stand with me? I, I don't have anything else to say except for listen to what He says and respond. Father, do a work in your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Won't you come?